He is NPR Senior Vice President of News Editorial Director, makes him the uh, one of the most important news executives in our country, in my view, because of the power of NPR. He's had a great career of 40 years in, uh, in the journalism world. He was in the Associated Press for seven years, where he was uh, top editor as well. Before that, a long career at the New York Times. He was the editor of the International Herald Tribune from 2005 to 2008. And he joined the New York Times in 1981 for the New York Daily News, where he covered City Hall. Welcome, Michael. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. And, and Meryl, I, I particularly want to thank you for that long introduction because we've discovered that on Facebook Live you really need to vamp for three or four or five or maybe even eight or nine minutes. So as we're waiting here for the audience to gather. It's a lovely day, yeah. yes. Anyway, um, thank you. And it's great to be here. And congratulations. This is a great conference. And, you know, I really do think you're focused on the most important subject in journalism right now. Because rebuilding local journalism is what we all have to be thinking about. And we certainly agree on that. Um, last uh, year at our conference in Newark, our luncheon guest was Marty Barron, who went on to be played by Lee Schreiber in a now famous <laughs> movie. So, Michael. Oh, yeah. So what do you G think? Gene Wilder is no longer with us. Mm. I thought of him as maybe mm. playing. No. Another Come one. on. Come on now, right? An Robert Redford, maybe? Well, I, 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 also, I also thought of Jeff Garren from Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah, getting, closer. Yeah. getting closer. Getting yeah. closer. Who do you have in mind? Well, I was Redford. Seems okay, to okay. <laughs> uh, even though he's 15 years older than you are, yeah, but still, right. you know, yeah. carries weight. Yeah, so okay. to speak. Okay, fair yeah. enough. Well, welcome yeah. in any event. Um, so, uh, welcome to all of you for our luncheon gathering. Uh, we're lucky to have Michael here, who came up from uh, Washington, where he's now based. Um, and I wanted to start off um, with... The issue that is obviously on the table here, you deal with a lot of things at NPR. You deal with war and peace. You deal with Trump. You deal with race relations. You deal with Trump. You deal with... <laughs> <laughs> um, but over the course of your year and a half tenure at NPR, you've made local, and it, what that means at NPR in terms of relations with member stations, among your very highest priorities. Yes. Tell us why you decided to do that and how it's going. Um, you know, as, as most of you probably know, uh, public radio, of which NPR is a, a crucial but only one component, um, is a network of uh, locally owned and operated, uh, publicly licensed uh, radio stations that now, of course, do many other things besides simply broadcast radio. Uh, and we are completely convinced that the strength of the network is the local roots uh, of each of our 264 member stations. And that's the thing we're trying to build from. So we're working very hard with member stations to encourage them to build up their local capabilities for journalism, for engaging with the community in various ways, remembering that radio was one of the original uh, community engagement uh, mediums, uh, what is a call-in radio show, but community engagement. So we're trying to build on that and build up from this network of very engaged local uh, organizations, and a lot's been going on. I mean, there are now almost 2,000 journalists in public radio separate from NPR. So maybe 25, 2,600 journalists altogether. Um, that's a large force. And if we can uh, network them together so that, first and foremost, they're building local audience with their local engagement, and that we also use that to strengthen our national and global coverage, um, we think that's a very, very strong formula for a long-term future for at least one piece of not-for-profit journalism. So although your role is to help strengthen their capabilities in this regard and use your capabilities to make them stronger, wiser, sure. give them better tools and so forth, their news agendas for their communities isn't under your purview, although I'm sure you think about it. What do you think the opportunity is for local stations in their markets, large and small? Well, I think you can already see it happening. There are many communities in this country where one of the major providers of local news and and information uh, is the public radio station. Uh, you know, I, I like to say in a lot of communities now, the public radio station uh, has become the second newspaper in town. Um, we all know what's been happening in the newspaper industry and those disruptions. Uh, there are a few cities where the public radio station is, in fact, the principal source of news. And, and it works, frankly, at every level. Uh, KPCC in Los Angeles has 100 journalists in its newsroom. That's not as big as the LA Times, but that's a serious force for engaging with their community. Uh, in Marfa, Texas, out way out in West Texas, eh, not so many, maybe seven. But they play a really important role out in Marfa, engaging with that sparsely populated area, 
much as North Country Public Radio does in the northern tier of New York State. So you see this development, and it's really, it, it actually really happened organically. I mean, I think a lot of stations began to realize on their own that this was the service, and I think that um, my friend Jeff Jarvis is right to use that word, not because I think it takes a single thing away from any of the journalism we create, but ultimately we are an important part of communities, and if we're not serving needs the community has, we're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna be indispensable, as I think Geneva said, that was her word. And we see that happening, and we think that if we just, we just need to keep building it, and to pick up one other word from this conference, I mean, I think the word cooperation is really significant and really needs to be thought about and lived. Um, a lot of what we're trying to do is actually improve cooperation between stations, between stations and NPR, between public radio and public television, and then ultimately with the whole community of um, other journalism providers, uh, not for profit in particular, but even with commercial uh, journalism organizations. In Miami, WLRN has a very robust partnership with the Miami Herald. They basically share a newsroom, and they share their news, and they make coverage decisions together. I don't know that that's the necessarily the model for every community, uh, but I think you, you want to look in each community at what, who, who are the most significant providers and recognize that the old model of journalism competing with other journalism is basically a dead letter. I mean, that's not, that's not where our competitors are. I mean, we can, we can talk about this a lot of different ways. My favorite is simply to say that our biggest competition is simply to hold people's attention. Um, or we can go back to your frenemies conversation later. And we'll get to Trump right. uh, inevitably. Right. Um, Absolutely. But uh, speaking of Marfa, I mean, let's talk about a Marfa or a mm -hmm. place like Marfa. What right. is the role of public radio in covering a place like Marfa? Is it a, just another voice covering City Hall, just as hopefully uh, uh, hyperlocal sites and mm -hmm. the daily newspaper continues to? What what differentiates and what matters in a place like Marfa? Uh, you may not you may not know the Marfa story uh, by heart. No, I'm, I'm actually fairly familiar with Marfa, and, and also, uh, in fact, if you drive due north from here, uh, you get to St. Lawrence, New York, several hundred mile drive, and that's the home of uh, North Country Public Radio, which covers the entire stretch of the Adirondacks, you know, huge, beautiful uh, area, like Placid is in there, Watertown, New York, home of the Watertown Times. Um, and they're a good example. I'll, I'll cite some things from there just because I happen to have been talking to them recently. You know, they have a small number of reporters and hosts and local talk shows. And they take very seriously their role in understanding what their community is about. And I actually once was at a conference of public radio news directors, and I was bragging about the good work that I thought they were doing. And I said, you know, they're doing this good work with only seven reporters. And their news director was sitting about there, and she yelled out, six! <laughs> and I said, well, and I'm, I'm, you know, I didn't connect it for her. I said, no, it was seven. And she said, no, six! And I said, well, I went on your website, and I counted seven. And she said, no, it's six. And I said, well, you list the horticulturist as one of your seven journalists. And she said, oh, well, okay, yeah. <laughs> and you know what? In the north country of New York, a horticulturist plays an absolutely crucial service. It isn't just gardening. It's... You know, it's forestry, it's the whole nature of that community. And I think understanding that local, local journalism, local service means different things in different communities, and we, aren't, we couldn't tell different communities what they need. What we can say is that every community needs it. We can be a part of that solution, we think, because our, our mission, which we were given 50 years ago, was to fill needs that were not met by commercial media. And I don't think that mission has actually changed at all. The, the nature of what does that has changed, but the goal is very much the same. But historically, public radio has been um, under-resourced, shall we say, yes. in the context of local news. And right. in most places, it's been ignored. It's right. not been part of the mission. They relied on you right. or minimal news coverage and right. music and entertainment right. and so forth. Yeah. So this is changing, and will it continue to change? Yeah, I look for, I, I, in every place from Marfa to New York City, expansion? We are certainly hoping so. We are encouraging stations to develop their capacity to define in their own community what that capacity means. You know, some stations are much more focused on doing uh, longer form journalism. Uh, Los Angeles is a very lucky place because they have KCRW, which is actually a terrific music station, but also broadcasts some of our national news programs and makes fabulous local radio documentaries about the homeless and about other things. Um, but uh, Los Angeles also has KPCC, which is, you know, a recognizably 
uh, hard news station that I think tries to compete head to head with uh, other local news in Los Angeles like the LA Times. And that's great. And, and they made their selections based on their market. Um, but we're encouraging uh, stations to develop their capacity for doing local journalism and local news. We encourage them to use their talk programming uh, in a way that engages around big issues. Uh, and we encourage them to develop their digital platforms as a way of providing information. You know, there's a fabulous example today of the service of public radio. Um, there are quite a number of, of uh, public radio stations in Florida, and they have built an emergency network which they are using today to provide news and information, emergency warnings, and anything else you might need as Hurricane Matthew has churned up the coast, passing one public radio station after another on its way up the coast. Uh, they have been sharing information and exchanging um, material with our help uh, to make sure that the people of Florida actually have real-time information about what's happening. And yours is a coordination function. We, we coordinate. We provide extra resources when needed. Uh, and the system has begun to really rise to the occasion. Many of you in this room probably know Laura Walker, who runs uh, New York Public Radio. She called last night and said, can we do anything to help? And that's no small thing, because that's a station, of course, that lived through a major weather ca calamity in Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy, as we call it, and uh, has a lot of experience. So we're working with them to see if any of the stations down there are going to need help. And if they do, we'll, we'll figure out ways to provide it uh, so far. Was, it hasn't been as bad as some people had feared, but we'll see. So we're here, of course, to talk about sustainability and models right. and so forth. Is there any evidence that public radio's efforts in local, its expanding efforts, have had implications for membership and other sources yes. of financing? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's a couple of things. First of all, it's clearly helping to drive audience, both in digital, uh, in NPR One, which is our digital audio uh, app, uh, and on the radio. I mean, right now, radio, uh, NPR radio listening, the listening to NPR member stations, uh, is up substantially and up considerably more than our commercial news radio competitors. So we think something's happening beyond just the election effect. Um, and we think a lot of that actually is the better engagement at a local level with more meaningful local news, as well as, obviously, we've put a lot of effort into... Uh, global coverage, election coverage, Olympics. There's, I mean, it's been a big news year, that helps. But the gap, the, 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 the way we're outperforming commercial radio right now leads us to think that some important benefits are occurring from the work that's being done. But it's really too soon to measure oh. it in any profound way. Yeah, and we're not, we're not building a system that's designed to be permanently radio. We're building a system that's designed to be a provider of news and information for communities in whatever form we can get it to them in whatever form they're willing to take it. I, I actually think some version of NPR One, which is you know, a streaming audio service uh, that can be localized to whatever community you're in and can include inserting extra local content for a particular reason. Um, we think that may have a very big future in, in local news. And obviously, various forms of digital and social media are already important. We're working very closely. You guys talked a little bit about Facebook earlier. You know, we're working very closely with member stations on how to expand our digital footprint together. Um, one of the things that's fascinating about our situation in, in public media is that we have a variety of overlapping digital footprints. So there'll be the NP people going to NPR.org or to an NPR social media account. There'll be the people going to their local station accounts. There'll be people going to PBS.org. There'll be people going perhaps to the local PBS station. If you roll that all together, it's probably 70 million uniques. Uh, nobody's ever even tried to roll it all together. And so that's an interesting issue. But and more important, frankly, than just rolling it all together, I see I've had one of Merrill's favorite topics, yes. more significant even than that, which could be pretty significant, certainly in terms of uh, sponsorship and that kind of thing, is if you look at the footprints, often the largest footprint in that community is NPR, not the local station. PBS, not the local PBS station. So we're starting to look at ways that we can use our footprint in communities to drive local engagement. So, for example, one thing we've been doing is we've used the, the, the capacity to localize Facebook. In our um, Facebook feed, we can feed a local story into the Facebook feed in a community. So in Philadelphia, for example, if Sandy Clark called up and said, we've got this really great story today, why don't you put it in your, we can put it into the 
NPR Facebook feed, and in Philadelphia or in the Philadelphia region, you'll see a WHYY story that, as far as you can tell, is just part of our regular news service, but then it can take you back to wherever Sandy wants, to, wants people to go, to her, her website or to whatever account she wants. And we're getting a lot of traction out of that, and it turns out that when you do that, and you guys all know this because it's what you're building your efforts on, people really care about getting that local news. So it actually helps us because it increases our audience on, on, I mean, on Facebook. We can come back to the, how much that does or doesn't help. But it certainly increases our audience in that community, and it increases their audience because ours was bigger than theirs to begin with. So both of us rise together, and then as we learn better how to aggregate the total audience, it'll become apparent how big the whole thing really is, and I think that'll help with, with our sustainability. Uh, for how many of you in the audience, show of hands, is NPR an important source of news? So, well, my job is done. Um, <laughs> and how many of you, since it's an important so source of news, think they've done an outstanding job covering the political campaign? That would be a third of you, I would guesstimate. Um, let's talk about the political campaign, because half or more of this room think you haven't done a great right. job, and that's an indictment and in part of media in general and the perceptions sure. of people like those of us in this room that the media has underperformed in the election season. Right. How has NPR done from your point of view? Well, I, th I think we've done better than that vote would show. Okay. <laughs> <I think. laughs> I'm not surprised you said that. Right. Um, I will say, I, I will say, you know, I've been, I was, I'm a, Recovering political reporter, I covered a number of presidential campaigns. I, I was involved at least in some way in every presidential campaign since 1976. Um, I've never seen a, a race as complex or difficult for journalists to handle as this one. So I think everybody has struggled in different ways. I do think that we've done a number of things that are extremely important, and, and one of them is controversial. I think we, from the beginning, made a decision that we were going to try to keep our focus on facts, not, not judging candidates, but on the factual basis of what they were saying and doing. That's become a controversial decision, interestingly. Um, and I, other news organizations have taken a somewhat different point of view on that. I do think that in the long run, trying to remain focused on the role of pre pre presenting reliable, verified, authenticated information that everybody can agree upon is still the most important role we can play in any discussion. Which isn't to say that I, have a, I don't have a moral problem with those who've decided we should characterize candidates in some specific way. We can come back to the particulars. And we but, will. And we will, thank you. I knew I could count on you for that. But, but I actually, I, I really think that there's a fundamental question here, which is what's our most useful role. And I'll tell you, my best example of this was the night, and I'll let's go straight to Donald Trump. So Donald Trump was in a church in Flint, Michigan a couple of weeks ago, and he started, at first he was talking about just the good people of Flint and the challenges of Flint, and the challenges of being an African American in this country, and then he started wandering into the flaws of Hillary Clinton, and the pastor cut him off and said, you promised you weren't going to do that at this church. And he stopped, and the, and the moment moved on. The next morning, Donald Trump got up and wove a fairy tale about what had happened in that church the night before. And our guy, Scott Horsley, who's a terrific reporter, was in the church. So he took his eyewitness account of that church moment, and he laid it out, and right next to it juxtaposed Donald Trump's description of that moment. And I don't think there's a single person who heard or read that account who would have any doubt about what, any, what happened, not one. Some people wanted us to go one step further and say Donald Trump lied about that moment. I don't have any problem with why people are saying that. I don't think that adds anything to what we did because the value of what we did was having Scott in that church, having his eyewitness account, which by the way became the basis for every other story <laughs> virtually about the moment, including all the stories that decided they wanted to call him a liar. So. It's, it's a view. It's my view. It's not the view of the world. And well, it it's the view of NPR, view. therefore. It, correct. <laughs> That's true. Thank you for that. Yeah, but. No, no, and, I, and, I, and I, I, I stand by it, and I do think it's, it's valuable. I don't think it needs to be the view of everybody in journalism. I think, frankly, the First Amendment guarantees our right to have a lot of different kinds of journalism. And we always have, by the way. 
Um, but I think Scott, Scott Horsley did his job in that church right now. And by doing his job, he allowed the rest of the country to talk about that moment. And we would only interfere with people's ability to hear his report or read it by adding um, volatile language. And that's my view, and that is the view of NPR. And, and, you, and, and you use the L word, right. um, which uh, Dean Bakay, the editor of the New York Correct. Times, uh, acknowledged in an interview with NPR, with NPR among yeah. other places, right. that they were going to start to use in reference to candidates. Right. I think in the case of the presidential election, both as editors of the New York Times see fit. Right. And you were actually mentioned in that interview, juxtap <laughs> juxtaposed against Dean's view of that, right. saying, we won't. What do you think of his view? And is that influential in your thinking? Um, you know, Dean and I have known each other for many years. He's a first-class journalist. I don't agree with him for us. He's the editor of the New York Times. He has to edit it uh, the way he sees fit. I think one thing that gets a little missed in this conversation is the idea that he is more courageous to call him the name than not, which I don't buy at all. Um, I don't think either is a terrible act of courage, frankly, compared to going down a road in Helmand Province, for example. But, you know, his audience is pretty well prepared to accept that point of view anyway. So I don't think, I don't think he's swimming against his audience because, frankly, the New York Times has run a lot of material already to support the point of view. And if you want to go the next step and use that word, I think that's okay. And I don't think you're going to get a lot of pushback. Um, I don't think doing that helps. I mean, I don't think it actually makes our journalism read more. I don't think it gets anybody who wasn't going to see us to see us. I, mean, I think it's really important to, be, to reach as many people as you can with the most reliable journalists you can. That's, that's my view. And that's why I think laying the facts out clearly is more important than what name we decide to append to the facts. Uh, as you know, we focused very heavily on the literal act of fact-checking during this campaign, and I think I've had some some progress in how that's done for, for people, and I've been incredibly encouraged by how much people want that kind of service, because I think, you know, by the time we invented the version that we used at the debate, millions of people came to us to use it, and we've actually now been giving it to other public media organizations to just use, use our version of a fact-check. So... You know, that's our focus. That's the way we decided to handle this campaign. Uh, I think the debate's a good one. That's why we put it on NPR. We were happy to have Dean come on and describe why he had his point of view. Um, I kept away from that story. I didn't tell them to put me in it or not. They you did that. They were prominently there. They did it. That was their call to do that, but I didn't mind it. It was fine. I mean, it's, a, it's good to, to argue about these things. So looking over the landscape of media against... But let me just, let yes. me just to, to, to emphasize the point. I think it's good to argue about this. I don't think this is anything like the most important issue facing journalism right now. The most important issue facing journalism right now is how are we going to sustain the boots on the ground to do the kind of reporting that the country needs, both in, in local communities and in international journalism. That's the issue. And I appreciate that. I mean, that's, that, I, you're, so. You're, you're preaching to the choir. Well, I, I know, yeah. <laughs> So anyway, enough said. I, that, but ha, looking at your com competition, and you do have lots of competition covering sure. national political campaigns. Absolutely. Do you share the critique that their coverage has been inadequate and that apparently you think yours has risen above some of that? Well, let's go to a couple of different criticisms. So I do not believe, and this will be one of the few times I'll disagree with my friend Jeff, I don't believe that the Trump success is an illustration of the failure of journalism. I actually don't buy that. And I think there's a couple of, a couple of points to cite there. Um, the first is that when you talk to Trump supporters, they know exactly who this guy is. I mean, they know. This is, that's not what this election's about. That doesn't mean to say we couldn't do a better job. Those are two different thoughts. But I don't believe that Donald Trump is where he is because journalism didn't do something it should have done. I think it, is a it would be accurate to say that during the primary season before his nomination, there were a lot of uh, establishment or uh, you know, established forces, including the media and the Republican Party, that didn't quite get what was happening. And he benefited from that moment. And I think it's also true, I think it would also be fair to say that there were a couple of broadcast outlets that gave him an enormous amount of time for not much purpose, and that somehow he, he got the drop on the rest of his opponents in the Republican primaries. So 
you can make an argument. Jeff and I can have a debate later on this subject for those who want to stay. In the hallway, please. In the hallway. But I mean, I think you can make an argument about winning the Republican nomination and that there was a media element to that. But the idea that he's now within a few points of the Democratic nominee for president and that that somehow was because the media didn't deal with him strong enough, I, I, that one isn't true. Because it's, they, they well, that's, that's your point of view. But, I mean, well, that's, it's, I believe it's not true. <laughs> okay. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Tune in for more. But, but I, it, I, so I, I don't, which isn't the same as saying, I think there's a lot more that could have been done a lot sooner. Uh, about Particularly that, on uh, his business life, right? His business life. Um, you know, there was coverage. WNYC, in fact, did a number of interesting things. The New York Times obviously did things. Um, would more of it happen sooner if more people had realized sooner in the primary process what a big uh, uh, possibility he was? Probably. So in that sense, people were slow to rise to the occasion because they were slow to realize what was happening. So, and, and just to finish that thought, I think that's a function of a whole other issue, which is I do think that most newsrooms in this country are not as well connected to um, the, let's think of the right ways to describe this, but that, that community of lower income, often religious, often uh, rural people who are the core of Trump's supporters are not well understood or represented in American newsrooms. And I do think that that was a factor in not understanding the movement that was occurring that he wrote. Uh, and I think you know, that that was a lot of the power of the Tea Party, and people were often caught, were, were caught by surprise early on in that. And clearly, we didn't adopt enough to that in the presidential race. The Republican Party had spent years trying to keep that Tea Party base from controlling the Republican presidential race. They, 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 this, was, this was basically the failure of a Republican strategy to run to the right and to the Tea Party in midterm elections and to the middle in presidential years. That completely collapsed on them this year. and Lots of people didn't see that coming. Anyway. Okay. Um, so your role in, um, in covering domestic politics is obviously very important. We've just discussed sure. just a slice of it. Um, your role in covering the world is increasingly important as yeah. U.S. news organizations withdraw from the world and you, in some ways, even expand. Among the things you've had to deal with uh, this year and the challenging year it's been is the sad passing of David Gilkey, photographer who was uh, killed in Afghanistan. Tell us about that circumstance and what it's told you about the challenges of covering the world. Well, you know, I, I won't, this is not something you haven't heard before, but it's become extremely dangerous and difficult to cover some of the important stories in the world. Uh, and we recognize at NPR that one of our major uh, responsibilities is to continue that kind of coverage, even as a lot of other organizations have decided that it's too expensive or too difficult. Um, uh, David Gilkey was an interesting figure at NPR. He was our chief photographer. And of course, I'm often asked, why does a radio network have a photographer? Um, and of course, the answer, as we all know, is because you can't just be radio anymore or print anymore or anything anymore. You have to operate in every medium, and David really em embraced that mission with huge enthusiasm. Uh, he was very proud of the idea that he had invented what it ought to look like to be NPR on digital, and he would, he would talk about it. I mean, he would give talks about it, and he would go home and tell his family about it. Uh, I was surprised to learn after his death that uh, he had had long talks with his mom about it. Um, and, and so he, he really represented something very special about the future of public radio, frankly. And so his death was a tremendous shock. Um, he, he went, he had, got, he had been to Afghanistan many times. Uh, we actually, after his death, we tried to figure out how many, and we're not absolutely certain, because not all of it was for NPR. Some of it was before he came, but we think it was 15 times, which makes him, made him one of the most experienced American correspondents in Afghanistan. He went with some colleagues, including Zabihula Tamana, who was a local Afghan journalist who worked for us in Afghanistan. And I really mention his name because so much of the journalism that gets back to us in America now is dependent on people like Zabi. So I really want to make sure that we remember both Zabi and David. They went to figure out what was really happening in Afghanistan as the United States withdrew and turned over the prosecution of the war to the Afghan army. So they 
got there, we had lots of conversations about how to stay safe, but we also understood there was almost no way to do this without some risk. They decided it was crucial uh, to go down to Helmand province, the, probably the, one of the most contested areas of Afghanistan. And the uh, Afghan general in charge of Helmand province told them that it was safe to go up a road uh, and that he would go with them. So they assumed, well, the general's gonna go with us, this isn't so bad. Uh, unfortunately, the general was wrong. They're, they were caught in a Taliban ambush, a rocket pr propelled grenade hit the vehicle that David and Zabi were riding in and they were killed instantly, as far as we can tell. Um, and it was a terrible loss, and I, I think uh, most of us at NPR are still struggling with, with the, um, the loss, but we're also recognizing that our commitment to international journalism is only all the more important because of it. Uh, we've established a fund in the name of David and Zabi to continue to support uh, international journalism, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased to say that the Corporation for Public Broadcasting uh, gave us a, a nice bequest to get it started. But we're, as you said, we're not only not withdrawing from it, we're really trying to press forward because, you know, this country can't hide from the world. It has to know what's going on in the world, and we see a, a responsibility in that area. Um, we'll take a few questions in a few minutes. Hopefully there's a mic ready to wander around. Okay, the mic's over here. Uh, is there a question for, um, for Michael that anyone would like to raise? Um, well, why don't you come up here and bring the mic while I ask another question. Uh, so uh, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about NPR's economics. Mm -hmm, NPR sure. has it's been widely reported, has teetered from time to mm -hmm. time, and has rebounded. And at least the optics are now that it is rebounding mm -hmm. and that things are relatively healthy there. Assess the health of NPR, which you're trying to expand and grow and move into new areas in a difficult environment, for right. sure. Yes. I mean, no media company can say that it's safe out there. Um, it's a, every day is a challenge, but we are, I think, we're clearly in a better place than we were a few years ago when the company was running deficits every year and was, I think, in pretty serious danger. Um, you know, NPR has a pretty mixed revenue stream. We get maybe, if you, if you take all of public radio, it's, it's, which is, I think, a more honest way to describe it, about 15% of public radio's revenue comes from the federal government. And then the rest is a, is a mix of member support, uh, uh, the um, what we would call sponsorship, advertising basically, um, and then other kinds of um, uh, support from foundations and other, other kinds of donors. And we're seeing a lot of growth in audience. Uh, every, every one of our uh, channels or platforms is up this year. Um, as I mentioned before, our radio listening is up substantially this year, and it's up a lot more than would be explained just by the election. So we're hopeful that there's at least some period of time in which um, radio will continue to at least maintain its present audiences. But we, we know that that's not something we can rest on. We, I feel, in fact, I say to people at the office that we've uh, been given a gift from the media gods because uh, we know the ultimate outcome. I mean, we know there's going to be huge disruption and audiences are going to move in a lot of different directions. But we've given a, been given a bit of a grace period where radio listening is still strong. And during that period, it's our obligation to figure out how to reach people both with our audio and with our news and other forms uh, while we still have this uh, source of revenue and audience from radio. So that's what we're about. We've developed you know, apps to reach people with audio. We're working very closely uh, with member stations on that kind of thing because clearly these are it's all really the same audience. And in, in radio, it is literally the same audience, but even in digital, essentially, it, it can be the same audience. And so, you know, we've been able to grow modestly in terms of overall revenue the last couple of years. You know, we're still very careful not to, not to get into some overspending things. So we try to grow slowly. We try to do as much as we can with partnerships and cooperative ventures, uh, as I think any smart company would do now. And we're reasonably optimistic that the future um, is going to have a good place for a news organization like NPR. We're growing very rapidly in podcasting. Uh, I don't know what podcasting will look like in the future. I'm personally thinking that what's actually going to happen is that the thing we call podcasting and the thing we call streaming are actually just going to meld together, and there will be one thing where you'll get things that are what we now call podcasts, and you'll get things that we now call newscasts, and you'll get a bunch of things that we now call segments on magazines. Isn't that NPR and, One? Well, it is essentially NPR One. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and 
We think that'll be one of the major ways the future will work. Or not. <laughs> Maybe something else will happen. But whatever it is, we're, we're trying to experiment and do things. And, you know, we, we got a lot of people inside the NPR newsroom this year to do Facebook Live, not because I necessarily think that's a crucial part of our future, but because I think it was crucial for people to be thinking, as David Gilkey thought, well, what's that look like to be on the radio, right? So, so I think um, we're encouraged by what's going on right now. And the one other thing I would say is I do think there are a lot of people out there who want to support journalism. They want to support local journalism because they need it in their communities. They want to support global journalism because they understand their country needs it. And, you know, part of what we all have to do is keep inventing and reinventing how we do it so that it really fits into the world that we now live in. And where's that mic? Yes, please. So, Hello? I can just talk to you. Right. But there's, so we have a global streaming audience. Global streaming audience. <laughs> So in terms of uh, the current uh, Trump and Clinton campaign, what do you think was the, you were saying how different regions of the country look with uh, forms of like seeds of distrust for the media. Mm -hmm. you know, the role of media is to be objective. So why do you think that certain areas will believe that media is twisting actual sound bites from candidates to say that it's untrue even though it is what they said? Um, so first of all, just to flag it, I'm not sure that even everybody would agree that the role of the media is to be objective, but we can sort of come back on that one. Um, and I don't much use that word, objective, because I'm not even 100% sure I know what it means. I do, I, do, I do think that the role of the media is first and foremost to report, to go out and find stuff and to figure out what's going on and to tell you the facts on the ground and the nature of what's happening. Um, there is clearly, first of all, let's talk cosmically and then more close up. The collapse of trust in institutions, you know, is huge and massive and has been underway for almost 50 years now. Uh, and it's very scary. In, and, it, and that runs pretty much across the gamut. I mean, you know, the left slack collapse of faith in institutions is not all that different from the right collapse. There are fine points in there, but people fundamentally don't believe in big institutions much anymore, whether it's the army or the banks or the government or us. Media, big media, anyway. Um, there is a subset in that of people, and I don't even like to call them on the right in a way because that's not really who they are. They're not, you know, conservatives in some ideological sense. They're people who feel completely estranged from the society. You know, lower, in, lower working class white people in this country feel completely cut off, and part of what they feel cut off from is media. They, they, don't, they don't connect to it. I'm not actually saying they're right, but that's how they feel. And they just don't believe most of what's printed or broadcast or sent out on digital. And that's created a huge opening for all sorts of conservative, leaning kind of webs. I get I hate using even the word conservative because it's not really about their ideology. It's just about stuff that gets out there that circulates in this internet world uh, much of it is just flat false. Some of it is kind of true, but twisted around. And that echo chamber has become a very scary place. And it's clearly one of those strange phenomenons in this election is the way Donald Trump from time to time dips into that echo chamber, pulls something out, and just starts talking about it. And, you know, that's, that's a, a worrisome thing. And it connects him to certain groups of voters while they're completely disconnected from the rest of the national conversation. I do think that one of the important tasks that media slash journalism has is to figure out how we can start rebuilding trust in us. And a, a lot of people have come to, the come to the conclusion that transparency, which I agree with, is important. And then they take it one step further to say, well, admit all your biases and drop this veneer of objectivity and actually admit that you're partisan or admit that you're political or admit what you think. I don't go that far. I actually don't see anything wrong for those who want to be that. I mean, if you want to be a, uh, a journalist who just openly says, I'm this kind of, I have this viewpoint and that's my viewpoint. But I think there's a place for journalism that is about 
the journalism and not about the advocacy or about even the perspectives. Um, I will confess that I'm, that's a, not a universally held view. Um, and if you want to call that objective, that's fine. But I, I, I think there's a place for that. Because, and I think one of the values that that kind of journalism can have if we um, use it properly, and I believe this as much at the local level as at the global level, is that it can become a place where people of different points of view can actually convene. And you know, my favorite example of this is you, know, you can have all the ideological points of view you want, but somebody still has to decide where to put the sewer plant. And if you're in local journalism, one of the most important things you can do is not tell the community where to put the sewer plant, but give them the information so they can help make the choice about where that sewer plant is going to go. And you will never get to a place where everybody will agree because no matter where you put that sewer plant, it won't be good for somebody. But what you can do is be the place where people convene around you. And I'm not sure that newspapers were ever perfect at that, frankly. I think in our minds they hold a bigger place than they actually always accomplished. But I think they at least aspired to that role. And I do think that many of you in the room can have a place in doing We need it almost more even than at many local levels. Um, and I don't know how to get there yet, but I do think it's worth the try. The microphone is where? In the back. Yes, please. Um, I'm a sustaining member of NPR. I'm sure a lot of people here are. No? Um, raise your hands. Oh, yeah. All those there people who said they listen. How many people contribute? Right? As many as um, like your political coverage. Right. <laughs> now that's the problem, right? I wanted to ask you about um, a kind of uh, radio broadcasting that I did. Um, I was actually, uh, I had my own show, I paid for the airtime on a low band situation where we either had to preach religion or education <laughs> and educational content. And I did that for six and a half years. And we were reporting on not where to put the sewer plant, but um, I said we, I was. Um, <laughs> but a, a big multi-billion dollar redevelopment of um, the Jersey Shore. Mm -hmm. So we were, we were reporting about you know, how many jobs were going to locals and how many domain. Suzette Kilo called in the night of the uh, Supreme Court decision. So then one day, <clears throat> Someone from the FCC came down, and he identified himself as a cable guy. And he went up to the roof and decided that there was too much radiation danger, and it wasn't properly signed. And he turned the transmitter off, and the station was off for three months. Hopefully there's a question. So the question is, do you see that kind of situation where people pay for their time, as a possibility, as an alternative? And have you seen the FCC showing uh, that they might be a little coerced by local politics? You need not answer the second part of that. Yeah, I have no idea. Although, I won't answer it, but if you got real information, let me know. <laughs> You know, story. Sa Sandy Clark's still here? Yeah, I mean, there may be, if, if the FCC actually did what you just said, I think there's probably a story there, so let's talk. Um, you know, I, I actually do think that there's a lot of search, uh, you know, the, the, the federal agencies that have been trying to figure out the intersection of all these different outlets and channels have, have a recognition, a realization that some of the ways in which things are structured need to be changed. Uh, the most dramatic immediate one for some of the people in this room, obviously, is the spectrum auction that's affecting public television. It doesn't have much to do with public radio. Um, and that's, you know, could end up producing a fair amount of money for certain, well, either for public television stations or for at least for the license holders uh, of those licenses. And whether we'll be able to get that money back into the system to promote good journalism and other community services is, is an interesting debate that everybody in this room ought to pay attention to because it's important. Um, I don't know enough about the low band license issue, um, so I don't know whether they're, that's, it's a, but it's an intriguing one and an interesting one. And there's one other one I'll mention just because I think it's in all our interests. Um, you know, every mobile phone in this room has an FM chip in it 
and the government ordered the mobile phone makers to include that chip so it would be available in case of a you know, national emergency. Um, but some, um, some handset, some telephone providers turn it on, and some don't. If everybody turned them on, there would be a very inexpensive way for anybody to receive FM radio in a new mobile environment. We at NPR think that that would be a really good thing if the government would simply tell everybody to turn on that FM chip. Uh, and you could then set it for low band. You could, you could do just what you said, or you could just set it for your local public radio station, whatever. Uh, you could even listen to commercial radio on it. Um, and, you know, it, in a way, it would be like the old transistor radios thing, but it would be everybody would have access to it. And the government perceived that as important to the extent that in the event of a really severe national emergency, uh, this would be available, but it's not really available to people now consistently. Um, I believe, I'm doing this from memory, I believe Samsung turned it on, but then their phones started exploding. So Only the seven. <laughs> <laughs> but, but Apple has not turned it on, for example. Okay. So anyway, I, I think there's some issues about this that are worth people learning about. Where is the microphone? Is it in somebody's hand? Is the microphone in somebody's hand? Um, so I have to make one last point, as I'm told we're wrapping up. Oh, okay. So you, as a representative of the system and of NPR, are big on partnerships, right? Yes. So I'm now going to ask every one of you to go back to your communities and make sure you reach out to your local NPR station, because the head of news has said they're into partnerships, and they want to work with every one of you in your local communities to improve your journalism and your access to your audience. <laughs> so please do so, and tell them right. Mike sent you. And keep, and keep me posted. Thank you. Okay.